and uh, how the lecture is con developing. That might also be an, a powerful mean to, uh, to inform the rest of the world what ISS is doing. Welcome here at the ISS. We are, I hope you know that, uh, are a development studies institute. Our students come from all over the world to specialize in issues of development and to contribute to social transformation in this country, in, her, in their country. Not in this country, although as a side effect, I hope that will happen too. That means that issues of development, but in particular issues of conflict and justice and equity are the core of what we focus on. And that's why we also want to be a platform for debate on those issues. And so I welcome the, uh, His Excellency, the Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Palestine Authority, the Ambassador of the Palestine Authorities, or other Excellencies, Ambassadors, representatives of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, of the International Criminal Court. But of course, in particular, I welcome my students and staff and other students from universities in the Netherlands. We are a teaching institute, first of all, and we will provide platforms for discussion for you in particular to sharpen your mind, to develop your arguments. Thank you for joining us in that respect. Again, issues of conflict and justice and equity are our special interest. And so I welcome His Excellency Dr. Al Maliki the Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Palestine Authority here. This is a very special occasion for you to be in The Hague. The Palestine Authority has submitted its credentials to the International Court, um, if I'm not mistaken, the 1st or the 2nd of January this year, uh, immediately accepted by the ICC. And tomorrow there will be a official ceremony where you will be welcomed and recognized as representative of the Palestine people. I think that is a major step and also a major step for the international community to be aware of. Now, of course, we have had elections in, uh, in, in Israel and that was also what you would like to take on board in your lecture, I suppose. And you will then introduce uh, the situation, your, your perspective on that as well within the framework of your membership of the ICC. I'm very happy that, well, I don't think you can, how would you say, disconnect yourself from your status as a foreign minister, but you're also a scholar, a university academic. And I would like you also to talk to us in that capacity. You had your engineering degree, you did your PhD, and you were for a long time lecturer in Versailles University one of the universities ISS used to cooperate with, and we are looking into opportunities to renew that and to refresh that. Um, I would like, therefore, also to encourage you to talk as an academic to us and to stimulate our debate here at the ISS in the Netherlands. May I invite you to the forum? Thank you very much. It is uh, an honor and privilege for me to be here today in this important uh, academic institute. Uh, but you know why I'm here in The Hague, is not to lecture you. This is really the added value of my presence. I'm here today to, as His, His Excellency said, to present uh, to, or to represent Palestine tomorrow in a very special ceremony uh, announcing the admission of Palestine as a member state to the ICC. Tomorrow, officially, Palestine or the state of Palestine will become the 100, 123rd member of the ICC. Uh, something that we have tried for many years 
to accomplish, we have failed in our first intent. I do recall I was here, I think, in 2009, trying to do that. <clears throat> but after our admission as a non-member state to the United Nations on the 29th of November 2012, we uh, were able to fulfill the requirements for membership to the ICC. What we are seeking from the ICC, we are seeking justice and not vengeance. What we are seeking is ending impunity to a country that has been over the years trying to uh, take such advantage by discriminating against the Palestinians. We are here today and tomorrow in order really to push for respect for human rights of the Palestinian people and the region as a whole. We are not addressing our claim against anyone. What we are asking is something for us. Something that qualifies us to be equal as you all. Equal in basic rights, freedom, dignity, respect, and the prospects to plan for our future. Something that we lacked to have for so many years. Dignity to our own people. Dignity to ourselves. Of course, we don't expect that from tomorrow things will change immediately. We know the process is very slow. And we know that our membership to the ICC is not, is not going to change facts on the ground. The occupation is not going to end tomorrow. And our basic rights are not going to be achieved tomorrow. But at least for our people, they will feel certain dignity that, you know, there is an institution like the ICC. They will look at gra the gravity of the situation and the violations committed against them by the occupier. We are looking for partial justice. We are looking for place on this planet where we can develop our own and contribute in building peace, stability, security for the others. This is what we are asking for. And so if anyone expects me tomorrow to take up issues in order really to you know, to take Israel immediately into that court. Well, I have said we are not seeking vengeance. We are seeking justice. And this is exactly why we are happy to be here today in The Hague, the capital of justice and peace. We hope that the ICC will respond to our expectations, will respond to our hope aspiration, and our basic demand and right for equality and for justice. <clears throat> I do recall when we signed Oslo back in 1993. Everybody was telling us that Oslo is a transitional process that's going to lead into statehood and that by 1999, the Palestinians will be able to achieve their own state. We bought the idea, and we were convinced that yes, why not to try something different? Why not really to enter into a process of negotiations? Maybe it is really the shortest way 
to achieve freedom and independence through direct negotiations. So we fully engaged in that process. We hoped that Oslo, the process that started back in 1993, will transform itself into statehood for the Palestinians by 1999. And we worked very hard in building institutions, in building human resources, in building capacity. And we were lucky enough to see so many countries coming to our help in order really to prepare ourselves for 1999. To our surprise, when we were approaching 1999 and when we were preparing for that statehood, we received a warning that if you unilaterally declare the statehood, then the whole Palestinian territory, West Bank, Gaza, East Jerusalem, will be reoccupied again. And everyone within the Palestinian Authority will be imprisoned, and all your achievements will be totally eliminated. Many countries, instead of trying to alter that wording, they came to us trying to convince us to postpone that announcement of the, the independence by 1999. Then we discovered something very serious. That way we were deceived from day one. That what was offered to us as transitional is becoming permanent. And that we, we, are, we are going to be stuck with that transitional process for good. You cannot envisage the disillusionment, the disappointment among all of us. But at the same time, you know, you cannot also understand how can we function with a transitional structure becoming a permanent one. Because this transition, transition, transitional structure was developed for a transitional period of time to lead you into something different. That transitional does not respond to all your expectations and needs. So when a, that a transitional structure becomes permanent, then it's not only that you are stuck with the concept, you are stuck with you know, the content of that concept. And here we are, 2015. Still, we are stuck with that transitional process, which was supposed to end by 1999, still active until today, 2015. For how long? I have no idea. I have no idea. We want it to, be, to end this year. We wanted it to end last year, but the others, including the Israelis, they wanted to stay forever, forever. So you can imagine the frustration, the disappointment, and why we have decided to be tomorrow in The Hague presenting or accepting our credentials the ICC. When we exhausted all our efforts with Israel in order to convince them that we should move into something different, into a transition of the transition, you know, towards permanency. We have failed. And we have been engaged 
into a process of negotiations. You can imagine it. For the last 23 years, every time that we say this round of negotiations should be the last, then someone comes and says, well, I have new idea for the resumption of negotiations, but this time, believe me, it's going to work. And in good faith, we engage and re-engage, and we have been in this for the last 23 years. Since Madrid conference until last year, with the last negotiations that were brokered by Secretary of State uh, uh, Kerry, and that really failed miserably because Israel refused to halt settlement activities, settlement construction, and to free you know, the remaining Palestinian prisoners, political prisoners imprisoned in Israeli jails. Under such prospects, when Israel refuses to stop settlement construction, when we engaged for the first time with Israel in the in process of negotiations, the number of settlements and settlers in the Palestinian occupied territories were not more than 100,000. Today, 23 years later, the number of Israeli settlers in the Palestinian occupied territories are almost 600,000. So, what, what have we achieved during 23 years of negotiations? Multiplying the number of settlers. Is this is our aim, objective? Our aim objective was to eliminate settlement activity as a whole, to end the Israeli occupation, and to allow the establishment of an independent Palestinian state. And everybody was speaking to us loudly and, you know, privately, that we cannot refuse an offer to go back to negotiations. And this time, this offer is different from previous ones. Believe us, there are guarantees embodied in it that will, you know, ultimately lead you to independence. And here we are. Israel has used negotiations and the rounds of negotiations over the last 23 years by not only deceiving us, but also deceiving the international community by building settlements, creating facts on the grounds, altering realities, and preventing the establishment of an independent, viable Palestinian state. So it's not only that we have failed, that we have failed to obtain or to achieve an independent state after 23 years of negotiations, but what Israel has done and created over the 23 years, the last 23 years, will make it even harder today to talk about the establishment of a viable state of Palestine. So yes, self-criticism is necessary. And that's why we as Palestinian leadership, who, are, who is under tremendous pressure again and again to go back to the same rounds of negotiations, we say, well, one has to learn lessons. One has to draw conclusions. If not, then we must be stupid. We must be stupid. This is what we have learned, and this is what we have to do. Now, after 23 years of direct negotiations, what, what have we learned? We have learned that we cannot 
sit inside the closed room with the Israelis alone. That's a wrong approach. We need the presence of a third party. A third party is important to witness what is happening, to understand the positions of the parties, and to see who is collaborating and who is putting hurdles in the process. But also for third party to bridge gaps with bridging proposals. That's the idea. The, the absence of a third party, keeping the third party outside the closed room, then nobody knows exactly what happens inside, unless you listen to the, to the parties. And of course, in this case, the Israelis have you know, a version much stronger you know, uh, than the Palestinians about what's happening inside. I can't really tell you that, you know, sometimes they were jumping on the table, dancing, you know, singing, saying jokes instead of negotiating. But this is really the way how they were behaving because no one was knowing exactly what's happening inside that negotiating room. So the presence of a third party is essential, is important if we want to go back to negotiations. Now, the last time when Kerry came and proposed negotiations, we said, we need a third party. And Kerry said, okay, we will be inside. When his delegation wanted to enter the room, the Israelis said, no, 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 you stay out. And the Israelis kept the American delegation out the room. This is exactly the behavior of the Israeli negotiators, but this is exactly what has really happened. Now, secondly, we have to define terms of reference. Without defining terms of reference, then we are negotiating what and based on what. If we do not define terms of reference, then, you know, we might really go there, just, you know, talking about anything, about everything, without really being able to have reference to something. And that's really very important. Are we talking about 67 borders? Are we talking about two-state solution? Are we talking about Jerusalem being the capital? What are we talking about? We have to define these terms of reference. If these terms of reference are not defined, then, you know, as if you enter into a room, you don't know what you are going to talk about. It's really terrible. And this was lacking for the last 23 years, ladies and gentlemen, was really lacking. So you can imagine, you know, how much the Palestinian delegation has had suffered every time that they were pushed inside that really closed room. Thirdly, what we, do know, what we need is really a defined timetable. Because if we do not define a timetable, then look where we are today. We are talking about 23 years of negotiations. So are we going to talk about another 23 years of negotiations? Another 50 years of negotiations or what? Let us really define, put a timetable. Let's say that we will negotiate for two years, for a year, for six months, for five years. But knowing that there is a timetable, there is a an end to that negotiations. That's important because without it, it's going to be an open-ended negotiations and this is exactly what Israel wanted. To have an open-ended negotiations, to keep negotiating for year after year after year, trying to convince everybody that don't push us, don't pressure us because we are negotiating with the, Israeli, with the Palestinians while at the same time, they were building settlements and settlements and settlements and settlements and settlements. So this is really very important. The fourth point is also important, is also to define the end game. What we want to achieve? Negotiations for the sake of negotiations, or you want really to achieve something? What's that really something? Ending the occupation? 
establishment of an independent Palestinian state within a two-state solution option. That's really important. Is, is, do we agree on this or not? Because if Israel doesn't agree on this, then you know why we are negotiating? For what purpose? If this is not really the aim of the, of the negotiations, then it's what's really the aim of the negotiations? And surprisingly, not for me, but maybe for many others, that Netanyahu, you know, came so open, so transparent during the last election campaign when he said, yet, yet, not in my lifetime, there will be no Palestinian state. As long as I am prime minister of the state of Israel, there will be no Palestinian state. So, should we go back and to negotiate with, with Netanyahu, who said that he is against a Palestinian state as prime minister? Is Netanyahu a partner for peace to us or not? Unfortunately, unfortunately, there are many countries who want to be blind enough not to see that and not to hear that, and still after such statement, they came back to us trying to convince us to go back and to negotiate directly with Netanyahu, as if Netanyahu is a real partner to peace with the Palestinians. So today, after so many rounds of negotiations, and after 23 years of occupation, of occupation, and, and the settlement building, if any country wants to venture by trying to promote or broker a negotiating process between Israel and Palestine, has to take into consideration these four elements. If not, then we will be either stupid or naive just to go back to repeat the same story as if we are not learning the lesson. We are not stupid nor naive. This is really very important. The problem is, is not that we are not stupid or, or naive. The problem that the others are either stupid or naive. And that's the problem. <coughs> so here we are. Israel <coughs> decided that they have to continue building settlements. And I, as I have said, the number has multiplied into almost 600,000. Jerusalem has changed in character. Israel has punished the Palestinians by daily incursions into what's called Area A, major Palestinian cities in the West Bank. There is no immunity to anyone. They can enter, they can search each and every house, including the house of the president or my house. So that's the case. Everything, every day, that really happens. They can stop transferring our money being really collected through a system that was really agreed back in 1993. And so, in that case, and after the international community has failed us miserably, has failed us miserably, because every day there are Palestinian houses being demolished, every day there are Palestinian people being either killed or injured or imprisoned, Every day there is Palestinian land being really confiscated and every day there are people being really expelled from houses, homes, outside of their cities, including children, including children. And when the international community fails us and fails us miserably for so many years and after we try repeatedly asking, knocking the doors of each and every country, asking for protection, protecting our civilian population, 
from such aggression and with no vein. What option or alternative is left to us? Except go back to the roots of the problem, to the United Nations, to the multilateral system where everything belongs and ask for justice. And this is exactly what we have tried in December last year. When we thought in coordination with our Arab brothers to present a resolution to the Security Council asking and demanding to put an end to the occupation, to define a date for ending the occupation. We thought it is legitimate for us to aspire for defining a date for ending the occupation, as if we have done the biggest sin, sin, ever, uh, sin ever. And we were punished for that. We were punished for that. The US Congress cut all financial aid to Palestine. He used to provide us with millions of, hundreds of millions of dollars in aid, in projects. They decided to cut it completely because we dared to go to the Security Council and asking for put, putting a date for ending that occupation. Israel has decided to punish us by stopping the transfer of our money that they collect through tax deduction. And so we found ourselves in a situation that cannot be sustained because we rely on such money, the transfer of that money. 70% of the salaries that we pay to our public servant comes from that money that Israel really collects on our behalf and gets 3% as management fees. So they, Israel, not only tried to hold the money, but also to destroy the capacity of the Palestinian Authority to operate, to provide services in, 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 in the right way. We maintained ourselves for the last three months, but we cannot know if we can really sustain that for a longer period. So, Israel punished us, the United States really punished us, and for something we felt that is uh, right to us to do, to demand for a date. We thought that maybe November 2016 could be a date for ending the Israel occupation. But we were open, we were open for Israel to come and to say, well, November 2016 is not enough for us. Maybe November 2070. Okay, we will say okay. Maybe Israel will say maybe November 2099. We will say okay, but at least for us to know that there is an end to the occupation. For people to know that yes, there is a hope that the occupation will end on that particular day, on November 2099. But to keep it an open-ended, as if it is our destiny to live under occupation forever, something that we cannot sustain or to, to accept. It was our right, full right, to go to the Security Council and to demand for putting an end to that occupation. Unfortunately, the fight was not with Israel. Unfortunately, the fight was not with Israel. Other forces tried to fail us, and we failed to get the minimum nine votes in the Security Council. You know that we need a minimum nine votes in favor with the condition that the five permanent members want to use their veto. Well, we knew that if we got the nine votes, the veto was waiting for us anyway. But at least we tried. 
at least we brought the idea in the top agenda of the Security Council. At least they know that they cannot ignore the fact that the Palestinians are demanding putting an end to the occupation. Today, we are celebrating, celebrating, quote-unquote, 48 years of occupation. 48 years of occupation. I myself, I was 11 years old when the occupation started. Some of you even were not born when the occupation really started. I'm all, I am almost 60. I was 11, I'm 60, I'm formed, I, I got married, I formed family, you know, my kids finished university, they are going to form family, and still, we are living under occupation. Terrible, really terrible. You know, when you look at it, it's really terrible. And so, it is something that, you know, one has to do it. Two days ago, my eldest son just finished his master's, you know, in, in Dublin, in uh, nanotechnology. And uh, I'm proud of him. When he went to, to, to Dublin for the first time, it was his first time, you know, leaving Palestine as youngster. And when, when he got to Dublin, you know, he called me and he said, Dad, strange. I don't see soldiers. I don't see checkpoints. I don't see roadblocks. I, for the first time, I was able to discover what freedom means. So it's really difficult because I knew at that particular moment that really I have lost my, ch my child. Because my child who discovered and enjoyed freedom and liberty is not going to go back to live under occupation. Unless I, as the foreign minister of the city of Palestine, I will be working in order to guarantee that he will come back to live under the state of Palestine, free and independent. That's for sure. So it's, it's, not, it's also my personal fight to make sure that my son will be back. But this is really the situation, the situation of each and every Palestinian, every family you know, in Palestine. It's really terrible what we do, but this is exactly how we do it. Now, Israeli elections were held just recently, on the 17th of March. Do I still have time or just finished? Ah, okay, two minutes, two minutes. Usually, I, when I was uh, a teacher at the university, I used to take you know, the 60 minutes completely, not, not 40 or 45. <laughs> but, uh, you know, Israel elections were held on the 17th of March. And people were telling us, don't do anything. Don't go to the, sec to the Security Council. Don't go to the ICC. Wait for the Israel elections. And we waited for the Israel elections. What the Israel elections have really brought us? You know, the new version of Netanyahu, the, 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 the new version of the Netanyahu's government. And right now, everybody is telling us, well, don't do anything until he forms a government. Because you don't know what type of government he will form. How long should we wait? Well, maybe five weeks, six weeks, you know, you have to wait. Okay, we will wait for five, six weeks. And then, I'm sure, everybody will tell us, ah, the, the primary is in the United States will start soon. So you have to wait until to see the primaries of the United States. And then they will say, ah, you have to wait, because in Zimbabwe there will be elections. <laughs> this might affect everything, so you have to wait. You know, we are the only ones who have to wait for everybody else's. We are the only ones who have to wait because our destiny depends on the will of the others. You know, two days ago, there was a vote in the Human Rights, Human, Human, Human Rights Council in Geneva. And the vote was about self-determination of the Palestinian people. Self-determination of the Palestinian people was really basic, fundamental right of each and every people. 
United States voted against it. What that means? They don't recognize the self-determination of the Palestinian people? I don't know. Is this the same policy, new policy, what have you? Anyway, I'm sorry that you know, I took that long time, but you know, I can really uh, assure you that tomorrow I will be celebrating with my colleagues you know, the admission of Palestine as a member state to the ICC. And not only that, we, we will be representing Palestine in that ICC, but we will be representing all the underprivileged countries around the world and people around the world. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Um, Malki, for your argument, for your argumentation, for your explanation, also with your personal touch for being determined to work on solutions, but also to draw conclusions from the 23 years of prematurely halted transformation processes by explaining what would be the Palestine, how would you say, uh, conditions to enter into the negotiations, to have a third party on the table, at the table, to have a clear terms of reference, to have a clear timetable, and to agree upon the end goal. And definitely, you made clear that the end goal should be termination of the occupation. You are very doubtful whether that would take place under the current Israeli administration. Uh, and, but still, you are determined to work towards a solution. Of find that very much to be appreciated. We are in an academic institution. That means that arguments are open for debate and that, can be, and that they can be contested. And so there is enough time to do that and I'm very happy that you will now return to your role as scholar and uh, accept critique and questions from the audience. I have found a much better facilitator for the, uh, for the uh, discussion than myself. I have invited my colleague, Dr. Jeff Handmaker, who is a senior lecturer here at the Institute in Law and Development and who is much more informed about the issue than I am to facilitate the discussion. Jeff, will you please take over? Thank you very much, uh, Rector. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. Uh, and to all ambassadors, uh, students, staff uh, from many different uh, parts of the world, again, welcome to the ISS. As uh, Leo said, we are an uh, institute of uh, higher education, an institute of, for critical dialogue, and we welcome any and all views. I please ask you to raise your hand and make it very clear that you would like to ask a question. And I stress the word question. We don't have very much time left, and we want to, uh, I hear, see one, two, already, this is good. Uh, we don't have time for speeches, please. So do keep it short and leave it to a question. You, sir, I saw your hand first. The microphone is coming to you, so. A personal uh, remark. Um, a few days after the uh, Six Day War, I uh, came with my family to. Uh, the uh, microphone is not working. Uh, there I had been several times, and when I walked uh, through the small streets of Old Jerusalem, uh, where, I, where I had been when it was still not Israel, an Israeli soldier took some nuts from a person who was selling nuts and he took it with him and the guy asked him, please pay for it. And then he turned his gun against this guy. A bit later, I went with my family uh, to the Oliver Mountain Yes, I, uh, I think it is very important yeah, both because uh, we, had, we had bought, we paid for it, we had no gun, for grapes. And we sat for a picnic at the uh, Olive Mountain with a beautiful view. Please, sir, can you ask a question? And we really yes, don't have no, much oh, please, Thank you. Uh, because this, I think this is very important. I'm sure it is, but we need to have yes. move on, please. We only have a very a, short time. Yes, a lady came from the house, a Palestinian lady. She yes. could not think 
Otherwise, than we were uh, Israelis, sorry, she came sorry, to wash our question? grapes. Do you have a question, sir? Uh, yes, I. I uh, Please ask uh, your question. Uh, yeah, my question is about the time. Um, you say uh, 2099 is the uh, final limit. D do you think uh, that it would be an idea for Palestine to have, as the ultimate latest moment, uh, 2092, when there was the uh, uh, international okay. uh, peace tract be between uh, Saladin and Li uh, Okay, your question is clear. Uh, Thank you very much. You. you, sir, please. I saw you. Jane? Jane? Just, yeah. Can please keep it short and ask a question if you I'll may. I'll be as quick as I can. They can introduce Great. yourself. Hi. Uh, thank you very much, first of all, for the speech. Uh, my question is about um, what, what's, what's the goal with taking this to the ICC and whether or not you think the uh, proper criminal adversarial trial uh, is a means of finding justice in this situation? <coughs> okay, we're going to take another couple of questions. The gentleman right here and then the lady in the back. Hi, thank you very much. Um, I just wanted to thank Dr. Al-Maliki. I was in uh, Ramallah during Operation uh, Brothers Keeper and Operation Protective Edge, so it's really wonderful to hear your remarks. Um, my question is, in light of the recent comments made by the Obama administration regarding um, Netanyahu's comments during the Israeli elections, um, what do you think the prospects are for the UN Security Council now to reverse their position on Palestinian, uh, the state of Palestine having full membership in the United Nations? Thank Thanks. you very much. The lady in the back, please. Thank you. My question is, uh, do you think... Introduce that, yourself, please. Very oh, Jarlabi from French Embassy. Uh, my question is, do you think that... Uh, with the addition to the ICC, Palestinians are going to achieve uh, with the ICC uh, what has failed so far in the framework of you and the United Nations? Thank you. Okay, there's a lady right here in blue. Your Excellency was stressing the importance of a third party, and I was wondering whether uh, Palestine and maybe together with Israel have a third party in mind and which third party that might be. And you are? Uh, Margaret Fricard from Youth Peace Initiative. Thank you. I, it's nice, and it keeps it uh, Gentleman in the front, please, Ambassador. Thank you. I'm the Italian ambassador. Uh, did you already ask uh, something to the ICC? And if you have not, are you planning to ask something and possibly what now? Thank you. Thank you very much. Gentlemen, gentlemen here. Theo Kulei, newspaper, the Volkskrant. That's a very short question. What does um, the minister expect from the ICC? Just investigation into Gaza crimes or also into settlement policy? Okay, we'll take another two questions and then we're going to have to round it up. Yes, Hi, Alex Paul, student here at ISS. Quick question is, if the, set if the real realistic outcome of settlements is that the two-state solution is dead, do the Palestinians have another idea? Is a one-state solution maybe a possible viable alternative? Okay. You see? My name is Kuiper. I belong to the Humanist Peace Council in this country, Humanistisch Vredesberaad. I wonder... Uh, if Dr. Al-Malki could tell us, in claiming uh, the formation of a Palestinian state, will Palestine demand that Israel will clear all settlements in the West Bank, or might Palestine agree to uh, maintaining some of the settlements? Okay, this woman in the back has had her hand up for a long time. I would like to just give her the opportunity, and then Your Excellency. Thank you. One more my name is Olivia Flash. I'm an international law student here in The Hague. Um, Israel has recently published its third report into allegations of war crimes of its military forces. And as you know, Amnesty has also published a recent report uh, about Hamas committing war crimes. So I'm wondering if um, we may expect any sort of similar publication from Palestine into its own investigation. Thank you. Well, you know, uh, all these questions bring me to the beginning, you know, just, you know, to start another uh, presentation. <coughs> Let me put my glasses, I'm sorry. Uh, 
when I said, you know, 2099, it was a figurative speech. It wasn't really intended that, you know, 2099. I was really trying to say um, we are flexible enough to look for a date, you know, whatever date that Israel really accepts, you know, we will be accepting. If they will say two, three, two years, three years, five years, we will be uh, willing to accommodate or to negotiate. But of course, no one will go back to go to 19, uh, 2099 or 2092. <clears throat> uh, we do not uh, expect change in the U.S. policy. If anyone thinks that there will be a change, you know, then doesn't understand U.S. Po political system. Uh, just recently, <clears throat> when someone uh, asked that question, the answer came from uh, the U.S. administration said, yes, there is change in words, but not change in policy. So that's really tells you exactly what to expect. Now, the vote in the, in the Human Rights Council only took place uh, on Friday, three days ago. Three days ago. I'm not talking about three months ago before, you know, Netanyahu spoke in, in, in Congress, but only three days ago. And the U.S. voted against self-determination of the Palestinian people, voted against you know, uh, uh, respecting the basic human rights of the Palestinian people, voted against uh, Israeli settlements, you know, violate, you know uh, condemning Israeli viol viol uh, settlements policy in the Palestinian occupied territories. So, no, uh, we do not expect that much change when it comes to uh, uh, U.S. position. And so if we will go back to the Security Council or anybody else's will go back to the Security Council, then, you know, uh, I think, you know, we'll, we'll see... Uh, you know, history repeating itself, either they try to, uh, you know, fail us by not getting the line, or if we will get the line, then maybe, you know, a veto uh, will emerge. Or they will try to uh, block that by presenting counter, counter resolutions, uh, and in such counter resolutions, there will be elements that we cannot digest or to accept. I think this is really what's going to be the approach itself. Why we are uh, going to the ICC? Of course, you know, as I have said, uh, ICC is not its responsibility, you know, to end the occupation. It's responsibility to investigate if there were crimes committed against, you know, people by individuals tantamount to uh, uh, war crimes or crimes against humanity. And this is exactly what we have really asked. So the ICC is looking into that matter. Uh, this is really its, its, uh, its main domain and responsibility. We have to wait. Uh, we have really asked uh, them to start. They announced on the 16th or the 17th of January that they are starting in you know, a preliminary uh, investigation. Uh, and they will see if there is enough evidence to open an, an, an official investigation. So we have to give them uh, time and space in order to see if they will uh, reach uh, such conclusion or not. What we are... Uh, going to get out of that what we are aiming for. I think someone really has really asked. And uh, exactly, uh, in the declaration that we have signed, we asked you know, them to look into uh, 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 what Israel has done in the Palestinian occupied territory starting from uh, June 13th, 2014, meaning you know, uh, the Israeli aggression against our people, the last one against our people in Gaza. But since you know, we are talking about everything, that will mean everything. You know? The, 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 the court could look into each and every item, no problem, because this is really its own responsibility. And they will look into the gravity of the issues, and then to focus on this, this gravity. I think the Israeli aggression is one, but also settlement file is a, a, a very important, you know, uh, 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 another one. And uh, we uh, will try and we we are working you know in palestine in preparing uh, uh, both files uh, in terms of uh, documentation in terms of uh, material in order really to uh, help uh, the court to expedite its in own investigation or to focus more uh, on on these uh, uh, matters uh, third party <coughs> we have we have no problem you know if the Israelis will say, uh, you know, people from Mars 
to be there as third party will say yes. We have no problem. We have no problem. We have no conditionality on you know uh, the, the, the the type of the third party at all. You know, at the end of the day, what we we want you know is a third party that will be genuine, sincere enough to play that role role as a third party. And this is it. You know, we accepted the Americans. And you know, the Americans have voted against our self-determination. Still, we said, okay, we will accept the Americans. The Israelis told them, please stay outside. So, and they said, yes, sir. So that's really the problem. Uh, I think, you know, I have answered most of these. One state solution. Uh, <coughs> look, we have been fighting for so many years as people. We have really uh, sacrificed a lot of uh, uh, our most uh, dear uh, uh, individuals for the sake of having our own independent Palestinian state. And this is exactly what we want to achieve, an independent Palestinian state. We want to live in such a state. We want to be uh, citizens of a Palestinian state. We want to enjoy being citizens of a Palestinian state. And we want really to establish contacts and relations as state of Palestine. And so the idea of one state solution it comes as a, an alternative in case that the two-state solution is not anymore an option. It's not anymore an option. Now, the two-state solution is narrowing down and I think you know they, it's being re, it's closing down in terms of being an option uh, as a result of what Israel really does in the Palestinian occupied territories, in terms of really settlement construction, in terms of uh, everything that they are doing in, in, in the Palestinian occupied territories, preventing the two-state solution option from becoming a real option. Now, if the two-state two solution option is not anymore an option, then the alternative should be a one-state solution. Maybe, but you know, you have different interpretations about you know uh, that one-state solution. Uh, we, if you ask me, or you ask another any Palestinian or some Israelis, they will say one-state solution means you know one person, one vote. You know, where uh, within a period of five years, we the Palestinian Arabs will become a majority. You know, in that uh, one-state solution, and then we'll have the right to uh, right of return you know, automatically as a result of that. So why not? You know, it's a very attractive uh, approach. But you think that you, the Israelis are so naive to allow you, you know, to, to, to go through this, this process of one state solution, one person, one vote, that will never happen. The Israelis might accept one uh, uh, state solution, but with two systems. One state solution, yes, but with two systems, meaning that we will stay under their occupation, that the Palestinians living in their enclaves, there is a system for them, an apartheid system, and where the, 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 the rest of the, the, the others, the Israelis, will have their democratic system inside of Israel. So yes, one, one state solution might be an option for many Israelis, and I have read uh, articles written by uh, uh, many, you know, Israeli right-wingers who were advocating for one state solution, but with two systems. So we have to be very careful about uh, us being not fall in that trap and just to jump by embracing the idea before asking the questions, what it contains and what really offers. I think it's very important. Uh, Clear or set all settlements. Look, settlements are illegal according to international law. And so everything is illegal has to be eliminated. That's, that's you know, the, the, the point, of, point of departure. Now, we also at the same time, we are not naive enough to just to ignore that certain realities have been really created. And so we have accepted we have accepted through that process of negotiations that, yes, when we talk about 
the, the 67 borders, we accepted the principle of uh, territorial exchange. Territorial exchange. And in that territorial exchange, we will be willing to exchange a territory by another territory. And the territory that we are willing to give up, it's a territory where you know, it's being densely populated by settlements. So instead of facing that reality, to absorb or not to absorb, to accept or not to accept settlements in the state of Palestine, better option is really territorial exchange, where you, know, you uh, give up certain territory and you get in, uh, in exchange a certain territory uh, equal in value and equal in, uh, what do you call it, in size. Uh, this is really a better option for uh, everybody else. Uh, I think, you know, uh, the last one investigating about war crimes, I think it was. Uh, yes, uh, we have, we ha we have uh, uh, read uh, statements that were made by uh, international human rights on, uh, organizations about uh, certain violations of international law. Uh, that, you know, uh, during the, the, uh, the last Israeli aggression against uh, our people in Gaza, uh, that uh, uh, firing uh, of rockets uh, by uh, uh, Hamas or Islamic Jihad into um, uh, civilian uh, uh, areas in Israel is tantamount to, uh, uh, you know, uh, war crimes. Well, we, at least we, the Palestinian people, we have said, we want the ICC to investigate. We fear nothing. We are ready, you know, to face uh, 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 whatever outcome of such investigation. And that's why, you know, all Palestinian factions have signed a, a letter that they adhere to such an investigation and they are willing to cooperate with the investigation if the investigation requires that they, anyone, has to surrender to the court, they are willing to do so. So we have no problem to that. We expected reciprocity from the Israeli side. That uh, never really happened. So uh, here it is. Now, yes, I know that, uh, 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 that uh, the Israeli uh, uh, military, sometimes uh, Israeli army, sometimes they uh, orchestrate certain so-called legal investigation to investigate uh, uh, behavior of their soldiers about crimes uh, committed against Palestinians, either in the West Bank or in Gaza, like the one that happened uh, you know, in Gaza. And then they come to the conclusion that no, uh, no violation really uh, uh, you know, occurred. So uh, this is really uh, the situation. They try to do that to show that they have a legal system and that that legal system really operates. Well, we know uh, uh, exactly uh, such legal system. And uh, I believe uh, all uh, observers, they uh, cannot fall in, into that. But uh, it's up to the, to the court to decide. We are not going to interfere in the, in the work of the court. The court uh, uh, has to look into whatever investigation being really conducted by, by Israel. They will uh, look into that. And if they see that the investigation is worthy, uh, respectable, uh, uh, serious, uh, uh, legal, then maybe. But if not, then of course they will scrap it and they will look into uh, different investigation. So uh, uh, I'm not really worried. I have uh, full uh, confidence in the work of the ICC and uh, uh, we are going to uh, uh, wait for the ICC to, to uh, determine exactly uh, how to deal with this issue and in, in what pace they will do it. I think I really I have asked uh, most of the of the of the questions. Is that right? Thank you very much, Your Excellency, for really taking time to comprehensively answer these very good questions. Thank you very much. Um, we have reached the end of this event. Uh, we thank again the uh, Palestinian Embassy, Dr. Abu Zaid 
uh, for facilitating this. We thank very much the Ambassador for Europe uh, to be present here and also facilitating uh, to have uh, His Excellency, the Foreign Minister of Palestine, to be here at this very historic moment indeed. I'm a young guy, but I'm certainly old enough to remember South Africa, uh, where I worked as a young lawyer. And I want to mention this little anecdote because it certainly uh, taught me that in spite of a really desperate situation, anything is possible. And I think that we need that optimism uh, as we see the ICC taking up the mantle and prosecuting uh, the many crimes which have been documented, at least by gentlemen here in the room. Uh, we're very pleased to have you here as well. Thank you very much. Uh, I want to hand over to um, Professor Leo Dehan to close the event. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Your Excellencies, before I invite you for the reception uh, in, the, uh, in the atrium on the first floor, I would like to uh, thank uh, Dr. Al Malki for his presentation, for his lecture, for accepting our invitation. And I would like to present you, as in a token of appreciation, a book on The Hague. And consider this as a metaphor. Uh, and that metaphor might go into two directions. It, this book might invite you back to The Hague. That is very much what we would like you to come. Uh, it might be because you need to support your case uh, before the uh, International Criminal Court. But might we perhaps also dream of another return to The Hague as a city of justice and peace, perhaps to conclude a, uh, conclude a peace treaty. That would be the best metaphor I could think of. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, may I invite you to follow us to the first floor, so you have to go out and then take the steps and have a drink with us and continue the discussion. How are you doing? Very nice to see you. Thank you for the investment. How are you doing? I'm sorry that you can follow me.